you are going live in five four three two one we are live now so uh, good morning everyone today in yet another fellows academic round we have very eminent speakers dr manoj padman from delhi and dr mandar agashe from bombay today we would be discussing regarding the common deformities of foot in cheval palsy first talk will be taken by dr manoj padman sir is a senior pediatric orthopedic surgeon at fortis hospital gurgaon and rainbow children's hospital delhi and sir will be speaking on management of a uh, plano valgoid foot after that we have a talk by dr mandara agashe who is a senior pediatric orthopedic surgeon at mumbai and dr mandar will be speaking on management of equino varus foot in cheval palsy so uh, first uh, i would request dr manoj to share his screen and uh, start the talk you need to enable screen sharing okay Goda, are you the co-host? Can you enable it? Yeah. Ah, uh, now I can. Right, sir. Now is it vis? It is visible. You see my slides? Yes, sir. We can. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thanks to Molin, who is uh, coordinating this uh, academic uh, teaching program for the fellows, and uh, thanks, Gaurav, for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about uh, plantar valgus deformity in cerebral palsy, uh, just going through management principles as to how to evaluate and uh, treat them, uh, focusing on the principles actually rather than any specific uh, surgical technique as such. So during this talk, I'm going to talk about functional anatomy, uh, wherein how we kind of look at the foot in terms of its various segments, uh, the column concept. Uh, so that's wrong. It's not the pedocarpal unit. It's a calcaneopedal unit. Um, so it's a calcaneopedal unit. Um, and then you have how the plano valgus deformity evolves. Uh, what are the ecological factors? What are the controversies related to the etiology? What is its natural history? Why are we still unclear about how uh, the plano valgoid foot uh, develops and behaves? And uh, looking at the principles of management in terms of how to evaluate them, what are the principles uh, on basis when you kind of uh, move on to surgical intervention? Uh, what are the no what is the role of uh, non-surgical options and the surgical options as such? When we look at the functional anatomy, we are all familiar with uh, dividing the foot into the various segments, which is the hind foot, mid foot, and the fore foot. Uh, the uh, the toe parts joint being the transition between the hind foot and the mid foot, and the tarsal metatarsal joints being the uh, transition point between the mid foot and the fore foot. One also is familiar with the column concept, wherein the medial column is the talus, navicular, the cuneiforms, uh, and the first three metatarsals, and the lateral column is where the calcaneum articulating with the cuboid and the lateral metatarsal. So that's pretty standard. Uh, uh, orthopedic functional anatomy. Um, the reason why we kind of focus on this is it's easier sometimes to kind of understand uh, uh, complex foot deformities, uh, which all have a primary deformity and then a subsequently a secondary or a tertiary deform deformity de developing so that the foot gets plantigrade. Um, so that if you look at what is happening to the hind foot for any given foot pathology, what is, is it, you have hind foot varus and valgus, equinus and calcaneus happening there. At the midfoot level, you can have cavus or planus. You can also have midfoot equinus as well, a plantaris deformity. And at the forefoot, you have uh, abduction adduction, which is playing of the um, toes. So that's uh, an easy way to kind of uh, uh, to approach the uh, complex three-dimensional foot deformity because foot deformities occur in all three planes, in the coronal, sagittal, as well as in the axial plane. 
But you also need to understand what we talk about the calcaneopedal unit. The calcaneopedal unit also uh, um, uh, the concept of acetabulum pedis. Here, the talus is considered as part of the tibiotalar unit, and the rest of the foot forms the uh, what is called the uh, acetabulum pedis, um, and it's uh, likened to the uh, hip. Um, uh, whereas this is considered a constrained ball and socket joint. Um, the difference between the hip and the foot is that whereas the hip, the femoral head moves within a fixed acetabulum. Here, the equivalent is the talus. Talus is the uh, equivalent of the femoral head, which is in a relatively fixed position because it's connected to the, it's considered functionally uh, to be along with the, um, the leg. And the rest of the foot, which is the calcaneum navicular uh, unit, moves around the fixed talus or the fixed femoral head. So that moves along. Um, that's how the movement happens. So that is called a calcaneopedal unit. Um, and the, the and how these uh, the rest of the foot moves around the around the fixed talus is due to the strong connections that the calcaneus has with the uh, across the. Uh, chopart cho joints, the, the, the calcaneo navicular ligament and the Y ligament. That is how the whole foot moves as one structure. So that is important. Um, and also one needs to understand that this movement, the calcaneo pedal movement, you, does not happen in a coronal or a sagittal plane. It's an oblique axis which starts from the uh, medial side of the uh, talar head and emerges on the lateral aspect of the uh, calcaneum. So it is not a uniplanar motion. So you, one does not talk about um, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, or adduction, abduction. It's a composite movement which happens in, in all three dimensions. And that, has, that is how the normal foot moves. And, and it's important that one understands that because foot during each gait cycle, each stride, foot moves from a stable construct, wherein a locked foot, which is an inverted foot, is, and so that only movement which happens is at the tibiotalar joint. Uh, and to a supple shock absorber, wherein all the ligaments are relaxed so that um, the shock the, at the heel strike and the foot flat, the foot can absorb all the forces. So that movement happens through each um, uh, gait cycle. So when we look at the uh, calcaneopedal unit in a little bit in a schematic way, you have the talus, which is connected to the tibiotalar, through the tibiotalar joint, that's the, uh, that's the unit, and around which you have the rest of the foot, which is all, even though there are different bony structures, can be considered as one single unit. Okay, so that is it's the interplay, it's the interconnection of the strong ligaments which make the rest of the foot move around the talus. So this is how a normal alignment you would expect. Now in a deformity, you and this applies even in club foot, you know, in vertical talus. In any foot deformity, this happens. Now if you have, since my, my talk is focused on plano valgus deformity, what happens here is that. The foot moves in this direction, and this is not in one plane. So, you know, so the foot on a, when you look at it from a dorsoplantar plantar view, it looks as if the foot is just abducted. You know, the whole the talus is fixed, and the whole rest of the foot moves laterally, uncovering the talar head. Similarly, when you look at it from a um, sagittal view or a lateral view, you see that the uh, calcaneus has gone into relative dorsiflexion uh, compared to the talus, uh, and the rest of the foot moves along with the calcaneus up and out, you know, so that is, so you have outward movement in the, in the uh, dorsoplantar view and, and an upward view on upward movement on the lateral view. So what exactly happens is it's a combination of external rotation. So the foot moves externally in relation to the talar axis or the uh, tibiotalar axis. Uh, there is dorsiflexion, the whole foot, and there is, and the forefoot also gets pronated. And all of this happens through the calcaneopedal unit. So it's a composite movement which happens in all three planes. The axis of this movement is not in one plane. It's not a true coronal plane, not a true sagittal plane. It's a, it's a composite movement. So that's what you need to understand. Because if you correct one segment of the foot and correct the deformity, let's say you have a valgus deformity and you correct the valgus, the rest of the foot will move along with that and may uncover some um, hidden deformities. And that is uh, applicable in the correction of planovalgoid foot. So moving on to the uh, pathological uh, anatomy um, and uh, the etiological underlying etiology. It's a commonest foot deformity when in, in a cerebral palsy child uh, who has bilateral lower limb involvement. So in diplegics and in quadriplegics. Um, the contra there are controversies vis-a-vis -vis its natural history and how it evolves. 
uh, you know, so a young child who may have uh, plano valgus up till the about five or six, which may be a manifestation or an exaggeration of even the physiological thing, may go on to uh, develop an equinovirus deformity later, especially in hemiplegics. And sometimes in up to the age of five, six, you cannot distinguish whether it's a hemiplegic or a diplegic. So the etiological factors remain unclear. Whereas our understanding of a lot of these neuromuscular um, foot deformities came from polio, where it was considered like, oh, you know, um, it's almost like simple arithmetic. One muscle is not working, the antagonist is taking and uh, acting and producing the deformity. That does not apply in, in this in plano valgus foot deformity. It, the muscle imbalance is, is lesser even compared to a cave virus deformity. Um, because in a plano valgus deformity, if you try to analyze which muscle is active, peroneus brevis, you know, is active, but peroneus longus is weaker. So it really doesn't add up. And the deformity is also variable degrees of severity from a simple mild flat foot to severe fixed deformities. Uh, there are several factors which determine it and some of which are unclear. And the biggest problem is there is an unpredictability in terms of how it progresses. You know, how if we knew what are the factors which are causing it to progress, then you can focus on preventive measures. So more than muscle imbalance, it's an actually an abnormal force environment which is which is responsible for the plano valgus deformity. And it starts off with equinus. Um, most uh, cerebral palsy children, when they start walking, delayed onset of walking, they start walking on their toes, and there is equinus. This produces substantial stress on the subtalar uh, joint. And the subtalar joint, by default, the, uh, in a mechanically um, stable position, is actually a valgus position. Um, muscle imbalance does contribute, but not universally. Consequent to these abnormal forces, there are adaptive changes in the bone. So you, you have the acetabulum pedis becoming actually dysplastic. So that you can almost kind of, um, uh, for your understanding, you can think in terms of uh, hip subluxation. Um, the tailor head gets uncovered, the femoral head gets uncovered as the foot moves up and out. Uh, clearly, lever arm dysfunction contributes to the abnormal forces, which is proximal lever arm dysfunctions, torsional abnormalities produce abnormal stress. There, there has been a hypothesis that underlying genetic and racial factors which, which predispose a, a, any a particular child in a family for a plano valgoid foot tend to develop plano valgus deformities if they have CT. So the underlying ligamentous laxity, which, which we see in normal, uh, normal cohort of about 25% of children, we see flexible flat foot, they are probably likely to develop. Like, uh, that's one hypothesis. Eventually, the foot ends up with this. As you can see, that the hind foot is abducted, everted. Uh, everted. Uh, you can see the, the toes are, are all visible from behind, uh, what we call the too many toes sign, um, because of the forefoot abduction. All the weight bearing, as you can imagine, uh, if you draw an imaginary line from the tibia, it's all focused on the uncovered tailor head. So you'll have callosity on the medial border, and that's usually the source of pain. So what you see in that foot is a, a heel valgus or a hind foot valgus. Midfoot is pronated, um, a forefoot abducted and in supination. So there is a, a supination deformity of the foot foot, and that is a consequence of uh, to get the foot plantigrade. Uh, you know, because whatever the foot deformity happens in the hind foot, you have to, at the end of the day, body compensates to try and get the foot uh, plantigrades. So for a cave virus deformity, it's the opposite, where in the hind foot is in virus. So your pronation deformity happens in the forefoot so that the foot remains plantigrade. The lateral column gets shortened. So you have a longer convex medial column. To begin with, they may, the, the uh, pl uh, planar valgus may be uh, flexible. It can be partial correction. Almost inevitable, there is some calf complex tightness. Uh, it can be vary, vary, varying degrees. And there is always, um, or not always, concomitant torsional deformity, especially external tibial torsion, uh, develops in long-standing deformities. So this is what you would see on a radiological picture. And you can see that, you know, the, uh, clearly that the tailor head is uncovered, you know, the, the, uh, you, the, it's not articulating in line with the uh, navicular, the sclerose portion of the navicular, as you can see, uh, there is a portion of the tailor head which is medial to that. Um, and you have a segmental collapse, you know, so it's a, uh, it's, it is a midfoot break happening in, in uh, three planes, um, you know, so, so, so there is a discontinuity between the hind foot and the mid segment and between the midfoot and the forefoot segment. And consequently, you have secondary or tertiary, secondary and tertiary changes. You can have a, see a, a hallux valgus with uncovering of the first metatarsal head. So this is not a, a, an unusual presentation. It's a fairly common that you see in severe plano valgus foot. Now, the part of the confusion is that some of these deformities happen in ambulators. So you could say, okay, the post going across, some of them happen in really non-ambulators as well. So that is why we are not, we are not very sure what is the, the single one single factor which is contributing to this deformity. So 
Um, so even in the non-ambulators, let's say a GMFCS4 um, or GMFCS5, when try to make uh, make them stand, there is some force happening there, com coupled with uh, spasticity. So on the lateral view, you can see again the same segmental uh, malalignment. Um, uh, the talus is in much more equinus than the calcaneus. The calcaneal pitch is flattened. You can see it's almost like a convex lateral border, uh, convex plantar border. Um, there is clear sagging at the talonavicular joint, and, and you can see it's almost like a serpentine foot. What's the natural history of plano valgus deformity? So, physiological plano valgus can happen even in cerebral palsy children. And so, that's a common pattern until age of five, six years. You see that uh, most children have a, you know, a relatively flat foot. Um, and if they go on to develop hemiplegia, the same plano valgus can progress to equinovarus. So, one needs to be careful about offering treatment in a very young age because you could exacerbate uh, equinovarus deformity. The natural history in diplegics is that they tend to stabilize the same plano valgus deformity, which is logical, the same, which may correct in an otherwise normal child. And during the middle childhood, it stabilizes, and there is a potential worsening during pre adolescent adolescence. And that is again um, reinforces the force environment uh, factor, which is as the child gets bigger and heavier, the forces going across the joint are much more, and adaptive changes in and around the uh, talus and in, a, in and around the calcaneopedal unit make the uh, foot to sublux and uncover the pela head. So as a general rule of the thumb, it's it's advisable um, to focus on uh, conservative measures and non-operative interventions until the age of 9 to 10 years. Of course, there are exceptions wherein there is clear spasticity and with poor orthotic control, you're not able to do this thing. You may have to kind of think about surgical intervention. But as a general rule, one needs to be very clear um, what the actual deformity is before offering surgical intervention. And when you assess what are you looking at, it's not just the foot. There are very few investigations which will actually help you. Um, so GMFCS and functional mobility skill, GMFCS to assess the functional status. Do not forget rest of the limb. Coronal plane malalignment, varus valgus deformity at the knee, torsional profile, especially if extortion of the tibia, um, femoral intorsion, all of these can contribute to exacerbate the plano valgus. Concomitant knee and hip deformities may have a bearing on the outcome of your surgeries and uncorrected spasticity definitely will have problems in recurrence of deformity. Look at what are the footwear issues, um, especially in the ambulators who have plano valgoid foot. Now, as fellows, you need to be familiar with prerequisites of gait. These are the five prerequisites of gait originally elucidated by Jacqueline Perry. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, plano valgoid foot deformity impairs the first prerequisite. You do not have a stable uh, foot uh, in stance. Rest of the foot, rest of the prerequisite may not be so much compromised in a plano valgoid foot, but the stability in stance is lost the moment you have a foot which is uh, in a fixed plano valgoid de uh, deformity. So, what are we trying to do by surgical intervention? We want to achieve a plantigrade foot so you get stability. The foot swing is irrelevant so much in, if you look at pure uh, foot deformity, but they may have concurrent knee deformities which may affect gait. Stability in stance, as I mentioned, adequate push-off you want because you want a strong lever arm to kind of, uh, to for toe off and you want to prevent secondary deformities and to balance the pressure which is uh, abnormally loaded on the uncovered tailor head. Appearance is also important as well as footwear and orthotic fitting. So we touched upon all this. These are the, these are, these are pretty much uh, standard options for any uh, neuromuscular foot deformity. And you want to address all of this. Broadly, again, you know, this is not limited to just plano valgoid foot. Your options are non operative and operative. And non operative would you would start off with strengthening exercise, stretching, and muscle balancing with tendon transfers or soft tissue releases. You can go on to the next step where in orthos are used uh, beyond uh, conventional physiotherapy and uh, stabilization of joints with, with fusion. Um, osteotomies are important. That's where the foot. Uh, uh, we have tended to move towards more towards osteotomies rather than fusion to stabilize the uh, foot deformities because whatever force, if you say, let's say you fuse a joint, let's say you fuse the subtalar joint, the force gets transmitted to the adjoining joints, the ankle as well as the mid-tarsal joints, and therefore the deformity just gets transmitted further down or further up. Um, and the other option, of course, is tone inhibition uh, for correction. These, these principles apply to 
all neuromuscular foot deformities. Um, again, on an escalating mat matrix, these are your options. So specific with regard to plano valgus, what do you need to con uh, consider? The severity of the foot does have a bearing. Therefore, radiological investigations do have a very limited role in my opinion. But more importantly, it's an overall assessment of the patient. Age of the patient matters. As I said, the natural history has a tendency to spontaneously correct. So one should not rush into surgical intervention. GMFC is great and the functional status is very important in terms of what you can achieve and what your results are going to be with surgical intervention. Overall mobility matters. Concurrent deformities need to be addressed. So these, these are the factors that you need to consider evaluation. Not so much investigations. Uh, if anything, you know, pedobarography is probably more important than radiological investigations. The role of conservative management is a little controversial. It's considered primarily for prevention, but you really do not know what, is the, what, the, what are the factors which make uh, the deformity progress. Intuitively, you would think you want to strengthen the inverters and stretch out the equinus. You know, that's part of the, you know, because you have um, weak inverters fighting against the strong inverters, you want to strengthen the invert inverters, but these are not easily achievable. Role of orthotics, again, is a little unclear because there is some hypothesis that prolonged uh, orthotic wear in these children because it uh, can cause muscle atrophy and produce more problems. So it's probably limited to stressful activities to mitigate against ab abnormal cells. So prolonged walking rather than, you know, full-time orthotic wear, um, limited probably about eight to 10 hours when the child is on its feet and doing physical activities. Rest of the time, probably orthotics do not have a role. In terms of operative intervention, the crux of our, the talk, you're looking at uh, indications of pain, not so much the appearance of the foot, pain, especially under the uncovered tela head or, or the sinus tarsi, um, compromise stability in stance, which causes worsening of the gait. So here is a case. I'll illustrate this with a case. So you have a clear picture again, right side foot deformity is actually, I chose a specific case because you can see the difference between the right and the left. The right side is much more severely affected. Uh, you can see the degree of uh, tela head uncovering. Um, you can also see the how the core of the deformity is at the telonavicular joint. So the axis along the talus uh, intersects with the midfoot forefoot axis at the uh, telonavicular joint, which reinforces the calcaneopedal unit concept. Similarly, you can see again on the on the uh, lateral view. These are non-weight bearing views. Um, uh, ideally, wherever possible, you should use weight bearing views or simulated weight bearing. You can see that the uh, Taylor Navic Taylor uh, first metatarsal ax axis is reversed, the tamba, uh, whereas on the left side is almost collinear or it should be um, apex dorsal, whereas on the right side, which is much more affected, you can see it's uh, pointing, it's apex uh, planta. And again, the cora being at the Taylor Navic load joint. So in a child who fulfills the criteria uh, for such a child, um, uh, Provided uh, he's a good functioning ambulator, uh, my preferred choice would be a calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, which is also called a lateral column lengthening. It was originally described by Evans, um, but it's been popularized by Moscow, who kind of uh, highlighted the technical tips, the precise technical tips which are needed to kind of get a good result. And it works on the principle of acetabulum lampedus, whereas the calcaneal navicular complex moves around the uh, fixed telar head. Um, achieves correction of the heel valgus as well as tela head coverage. Um, medial side soft tissue procedures are almost uh, mandatory, uh, which will include plication of the tela navicular joint and the advancement of tibialis posterior. Bony procedures may be required if uh, supination deformity gets unmasked. Then you need a plantar flexion osteotomy of the cuneiform. Gastrocnemius is release is part of the part of the procedure um, because of the equinus. So if I could illustrate what we mean by the lateral column lengthening. So you have a plano valgoid foot with the tailor head uncovered, as you can see. Okay, that is the normal hind foot alignment. So if you do a, an osteotomy of the calcaneum between the anterior and the middle facet um, uh, and lengthen the calcaneum. So it is not a hinged osteotomy. It's a trapezoidal wedge, which actually lengthens the uh, both the medial and the lateral border of the calcaneum. Lateral border lengthen much more. So it's not a triangular wedge. So you lengthen it. And as you lengthen the anterior process of the calcaneum, due to its attachment with the rest of the foot, swings the rest of the foot uh, inward and uh, downward. So the plano valgoid foot is up and out. So the foot is swung inward and downward to cover the tailor head. So that is the 
crux of the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy. So this is what you would see. You have a wedge where you can see which has been stabilized with a K wire. Uh, you can see the osteotomy um, between the anterior and the middle uh, facet of the calcaneum. Uh, you can see the restoration. This is the same case which I showed. You can see the restoration of the arch um, as the foot is swung down and in. That's the uh, picture of the same child um, further down the line uh, when the wires were removed and plaster casts were removed. You can see the osteotomy is healed and the top picture, you can see how the uh, complete reversal of the arch has happened post-operatively uh, in comparison to the pre-operative picture. Here is another case just to kind of illustrate. This was not so much CP, but an unknown neurological problem with bilateral segmental deformity. Um, so the difference here is you want a structural graft. And so, so there have been certain instances wherein I have used a synthetic graft to achieve the same thing. And you can see the shape of the wedge. It is not a triangular wedge, it's a trapezoidal wedge, which restores the axis. That's how uh, the feet were aligned further down the line. You can see that the arch has been restored from a flat arch. You can see the arch uh, has been recreated and the uh, calcaneo uh, fetal unit has been realigned to the uh, telar head. Now, the key thing here is there are a few technical pearls related to that. It, ha it, is, it has to be a structural graft. So, tricortical iliac crest graft remains the uh, number one choice um, where you have provisions we don't have for uh, bone allograft that's been used and synthetic graft has been used. But the problem is synthetic graft can sometimes crumble. It has to be not, a, it's not a triangle, it's a trapezoidal wedge. The K wire is to stabilize the calcaneo cuboid joint, not to stabilize the graft. Uh, you know, that is secondary, that's incidental. You, even if the wire does not hold the graft, the graft is actually wedged in. But as you distract the lateral column, it, the calcaneo cuboid joint can get sublux. So, so you need to actually prefix the calcaneo cuboid joint before you actually distract. Graft release is usually done with the Bowman's gastrocnemius release in the same position. The peroneus brevis needs to be lengthened. That's the original description. But you can, if you have uh, the option, you can transfer it to peroneus longus to achieve some pronation of the uh, first ray. Uh, medial procedure is concomitant. Application of the soft tissue and tibialis posterior advancement is done. And there are uh, described steps in terms of how the uh, application is done and how the telonavicular capsule is uh, advanced uh, with the tibialis posterior. Post correction and has to look at the foot because sometimes the supination deformity gets uh, uh, revealed, uh, and then you have to do a cuneiform osteotomy, a medial uh, plantar flexion based closing wedge osteotomy to correct the supination to get a plantar flexion of the first tray. Now, there are alternative procedures which are again joint sparing. The triple C osteotomy, the calcaneal cuboid cuneiform osteotomy, is uh, another technique. Um, I tend to prefer the uh, lateral collar calcaneal lengthening osteotomy over the triple C. Um, there are uh, views both pro and against it. Um, you can, you can, if the deformity is on the suppler side and you don't think there is a lot of midfoot forefoot deformity, you can do a medial plication and just correct the hind foot valgus with a uh, calcaneal sliding osteotomy. Though that's not so much in favor because these deformities tend to be fairly progressive and that's inadequate in my opinion. So a uh, pictorial illustration of a triple C. Here's a plano valgoid foot. So you take a wedge out of the medial cuneiform. It's not so much a medial wedge. It's a, me it's a more of a plantar medial wedge to, uh, 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 to harvest the bone graft from there. You put it across the cuboid, uh, not the calcaneum. So you put it across the cuboid and that the wedge is reversed and put it there so that you lengthen the lateral column. And so the rest of the foot swings and aligns. But there is still hind foot valgus. So you do a calcaneal osteotomy and you do a medial displacement of the calcaneal osteotomy to correct the um, hind foot valgus. So that is how a triple C osteotomy works. Now, in the uh, more severely affected uh, children, um, the GMFC is for it. So non fusion options are usually referred for the good functioning. CP. So the GMFC is one, two, and the good GMFC is three. Not not so much the uh, the on the higher end of GMFC is three because it has 
uh, one of the criticisms with uh, the calcaneal long term osteotomy is that it tends to fail and it's usually uh, primarily dependent <coughs> on the patient selection. Um, so, in the more severely affected ones where there is compromised stability, you go in for fusion, uh, subtalar fusion to correct, stabilize the uh, telocalcaneal joint with or without medial column fusion. You can lengthen the calcaneal cuboid joint and fuse it. So, you get to achieve a lateral column lengthening as well as a fusion in one go. <laughs> Um, or you can do just a medial column fusion because if you uh, understand the concept of acetabulum pedis, if you lock up the telonavicular joint, the foot will remain stable. So there's not going to be any hind foot movement. Um, so that is triple fusion as a general rule is not used so much in plano valgoid foot because you, with limited fusion, you can achieve the same results. So here is a case, a severe uh, deformity, as you can see uh, in a GMFCS, in a uh, bad GMFCS, um, uh, with other liver arm dysfunctions with proximal deformity, stiff knee. So that's uh, her with the, uh, you can see the lateral view also with completely uh, distorted uh, alignment of the foot. This is what I chose to do. Um, so rather than lengthening osteotomy, I thought she needs a much more stable construct, which the MOSCAS procedure is unlikely to achieve. Um, so, a talocalcaneal fusion, nothing was done to the subtalar joint because once you fuse the talocalcaneal joint, the hind foot is not going to move. So, you fix, fuse it in the corrected position and the first tray is also being fused. So, you have a medial column which is stable. You can see the lateral view of how it is. She had a concurrent tibial durotational osteotomy to correct the tibial durotation. And I tend to do all of this in one sitting, sometimes one limb followed by the other in, uh, in the same admission a few days apart. So here is uh, another child with a, with a slightly longer follow-up. She's an 11-year-old girl. So she was, according to parents, until the age of 10 years, she was a good, reasonably good walker, but suddenly started deteriorating. She lost the ability to walk independently. She needed to be... Uh, uh, <laughs> with uh, liver arm dysfunction as well, due to torsional deformity, uh, femoral intorsion and tibial extorsion. This is what we did in two sittings at the same admission. Um, she had a femoral derotation, a tibial derotation to correct the extortion and telonavicular fusion. Um, and that's the, you can see the fused mass 15 months down the line when we were removing the hip plates. These were the x-rays at that time. She had some symptoms later to the prominent uh, screw at the uh, telar head, which was removed. And that's two years down the line. Her walking ability has significantly improved She's able to walk up to about 30, 40 minutes with just a tripod. She could do stairs, which she couldn't do earlier, with just a stable construct. And you can see how the foot is aligned. And on the lateral view as well, you can see the three op picture, the smaller frame. And you can see how the telonavicular sag has been addressed. And the tamba is collinear now. Uh, and then here again, you can see that the uh, telonavicular uh, alignment has been restored, has been fused, and the telophus metatarsal alignment has been restored. So in, to summarize, um, the management is primarily orthotic in the young, simply because we do not know how the foot is going to evolve. So I would urge you to delay surgical intervention as a general rule uh, till about nine, 10 years, till you know what pattern of foot deformity you're seeing. And surgical intervention is indicated if there is a progressive collapse, which is affecting stability in stance, pain related to abnormal weight bearing, footwear problem, which are all of which impacting mobility. It's not so much the appearance of the foot or the radiological criteria. Ambulatory children, GMFC is one and two, and selective GMFC is three. We have good functioners do a joint preserving option, wherein you do a calcaneal lengthening osteotomy or a triple C osteotomy, whichever you are comfortable with. My personal preference is a calcaneal lengthening osteotomy. The poor GMFC is the poor ones, the GMFC is poor GMFC is three. You should read it as a poor GMFC is three and GMFC is four, five. I would go in for a fusion and rather than extensive fusion, identify where the segmental instability is. So a telonavicular fusion can give you a robust hind foot and midfoot stability, and you may need first trace stabilization at the first MTP joint as well. Okay. Thank you. They are present. So uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, detailed uh, talk about the novel guide. Has made a lot of uh, given a lot of clarity to us. There's uh, one question. There are two questions rather. One is by Dr. Anil Agarwal. 
रिगार्डिंग क्लिनिकल टेस्ट टू डिस हेलो या सो वन क्वेश्चन इज रिगार्डिंग क्लिनिकल टेस्ट टू डिस्टिंग्विश एंकल वाल्गस फ्रॉम प्लेनो वेलगोइड फीट सो या सो इन यूजली इन सर्वल पॉलिसी Uh, concomitant deform the ankle deformity ankle valgus is not so much a contributor to the uh, plano valgoid foot deformity um the, there are no uh, clear cut uh, clinical tests as such but if you can correct the foot into an inverted position and usually at the subtalar joint then you should be able to assess the ankle status um and that is one instance wherein you probably would need uh, some sort of radiological view um a uh, hind foot long axial view to see whether there is any ankle valgus as well but as a general rule um concomitant ankle valgus along with plano valgus foot is 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 an extremely rare thing um, you may see it because of the tibial extrusion the severe valgus but it's usually not a problem um but that is one instance where if you strongly think that there is a uh, element of hind foot valgus contributing then you need a long axial view or a hind foot axial view to see what is the orientation of the ankle joint right sir another question is when can we offer extra articular subtalar fusion the arthrosis yeah. yeah yeah so i haven't elaborated so much on subtalar fusion as such um uh, again my personal preference is where i need to fuse i see the same result with the talar navicular fusion um subtalar fusion extra articular especially in the younger child and the last instance wherein i did an extra articular subtalar fusion and there are various techniques you can use a um um a chunk of bone graft or you can put a screw across is in a younger child and this particular child had severe spasticity in the uh, everters and had poor orthotic uh, compliance because the foot was in so much um, valgus deformity so in the younger child wherein you are concerned that you really think that this deformity is progressing severely and you are not able to control it with orthotics that's probably wherein i would uh, use um, extra articular subtalar fusion over 10 years if you think that um, you know this is a child who will not do well with uh, uh, lengthening osteotomy or joint preserving options then you can do a conventional straightforward uh, subtalar fusion you don't have to actually preserve the uh, extra you don't have to do it extra articular uh, you can use the same technique but you may need to do additional medial uh, procedures so the younger child selectively is where i would i would consider um but you can do it in the older child older children as well but i am not a big proponent of subtalar fusion right sir thank you sir once again for taking all the questions and taking out time for all of us so i would request you you to unshare the screen so that dr mandar can hey uh manoj i have a question this is sham i have a question for you Ah, hi, Sham. How are you? All good. How are you? Good, good. Any experience with guided growth in these ankles and feet? Uh, not in the feet. Um, ankle, yes. Um, where where there is a clear element of valgus, uh, medial malleolus through um, foot, uh, nothing at all. Because I think that if you want to do any interference with the in any form of uh, Uh, foot deformity you need to kind of uh, you know stop them from growing at a very very young age uh, to have any meaningful effect um yeah. that's my understanding so i've never used it in the foot anywhere ankle yes medial malleolus where there is ankle valgus yeah agreed so dr mandar you can start your talk yeah so am i audible and is the screen visible yes sir all right uh thank you so much uh, gaurav for uh, inviting me and thank you to dr manoj for such a nice elucidation of uh, the plano valgoid foot my 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 lecture will be on the other extreme which is the equino kvrs foot in cp and it's going to be i it may not be that extensive as dr manoj's one and uh, what i'll be talking about is this kind of foot uh which is this Uh, slightly older uh, adolescent, about fourteen-year-old female, with uh, heel valgus and this significant equino kvrs deformity. So, how do we assess them? I think uh, Dr. Manoj may have assessed, uh, explained to you about how to assess the foot. So, basically, you look at the type of CP with the ambulatory potential, 
whether it's a dynamic or a static deformity in the foot. So what you see is in the dynamic deformity, you check the inversion in stance or swing phase, whether the foot is inverting or, uh, or supinating in the stance or the swing phase, whether the child is able to dorsiflex in swing, that is one important thing to think of what sort of transfer we need to do. If static, which component is the most affected? And the most important is the Coleman block test. So you look at the foot from all angles. You look at the amount of clawing which the child has. Uh, here, as you can see that uh, the, the child is able to put the foot flat, but the tibia is moving back with some amount of recurvatum of the knee. And you can see that with the Coleman block test, it is not correcting. So it's, it has a heel valgus varus, which is fixed. Now, these are the tests which we need to do. And this is typically seen in a slightly older child. As you can see, if you see the two main types of cerebral palsy, which is hemiplegic and diaplegic, the end result of a hemiplegic CP typically is an equinocavovarus deformity. While in a, in a diaplegic CP, though it is slightly more unpredictable, in a diaplegic CP, the end result or the natural history is where the arch collapses and the child goes into a plano valgoid foot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to typically uh, uh, concentrate on uh, this talk on a hemiplegic CP with an equino varus deformity. So this typically is uh, happens in a type 4 hemiplegia which has a, has a significantly other deformities also and usually seen in a, in a slightly older child with an older adolescent. So I have this, this model with me. Uh, so it, this is a combination of tibio-tailor equinus. So he, he, the child has an ankle equinus. Are you able to see the model also? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, the child has tibio-tailor equinus, the hind foot equinus with the heel varus. So the heel varus is one thing which you need to look at uh, with the help of the Coleman block test. There is midfoot and forefoot adduction. And the most important is when there is cavus, there is forefoot pronation, especially of the first two rays. Now, these are the things which you need to look at when you look at a child with an equino cavovarus foot deformity. So, if you look at the management principles, if you look at dynamic deformities, dynamic deformities can be treated with soft tissue procedures, as the name suggests. So, they can be either releases, either tendon lengthenings, or tendon transfers. And static deformities can be treated with joints, either joint sparing procedures, which are the combination of triple C or selective osteotomy. This is a reverse triple C, which I'll explain. And in the late stage, a triple arthrodesy, which it is seen only used only in salvage cases in very, very old kids. Now, there are a few articles which I want the fellows to read. There is one article which is written by Professor Benjamin Joseph, Dr. Hitesha, and Dr. Varghese. An excellent article on the biomechanical basis of treatment of various foot deformities. Uh, Dr. Jo uh, Joseph sir has, has described this, uh, an excellent article, and in which he has described all the positions of the foot in various uh, uh, various foot deformities. He has described pest cavus excellently. So I suggest the fellows to read this article for better understanding. And he has also described how every uh, different types of pest cavus develop. So, uh, the in case of tibialis anterior paralysis, this is how it is where there is a first metatarsal drop. The, the pathology in the cerebral palsy is slightly different, where there is a significant clawing of toes. There is also some amount of intrinsic muscle weakness, which result, results in the KVORS deformity. There is another article from the Seoul National University, which gives a stepwise approach to equino KVORS foot deformity in cerebral palsy. Uh, I am going to describe the, this uh, protocol in detail slightly later. So what are the soft tissue procedures in cerebral palsy? So I'm not going to go into detail about how to do a Valpias or how to do a Bowman's procedure uh, or a TL lengthening. Now, this is typically seen in a hemiplegic cerebral palsy. This child has equinus with cavus. This is a slightly younger child, about the end of the first decade, about 9, 10 years old. And tendoachilles lengthening is a very, 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 very small indication for doing a tendoachilles lengthening in cerebral palsy is a hemiplegic CP who has an extremely tight TA with who is otherwise a very good GMFCS. These are the very perfect indication for doing a Steindler's release with a TA lengthening. It should never be done, done in a diaplegic CP. Now, you look at the child it, when, with, uh, when he's standing. If the child has an equine varus foot with heel varus in stance, 
which is correctable when you do a Coleman's block. This is an indication for doing a tip post recession along with the Steinlers and a tendo Achilles ligament. Now, uh, you, you should remember that there was an, a surgery of a split tip post transfer. Now, this is one thing which uh, typically is uh, has slightly gone out of vogue. What is important to do is, a, is a useful to do is a tip post recession, which is an intramembranous lengthening of the tibialis posterior, also known as the Roda Frost procedure. And if you have an equine cable virus with a heel virus and inversion in swing, which means that the tibialis anterior is, is overacting, in this case, the child also has some amount of dorsiflexion which, or he is able to dorsiflex slightly in the swing phase. That is an indication for doing a split tibialis anterior transfer along with the, the earlier described procedures. So you have this child, you can see that he has an equinovarus deformity with a small amount of cabus. And you can see that he even with knee flexion, his, his deformity is not correcting. He also has a minus 20 degrees of ankle deformity and the, also has some amount of popliteal angle, which is uh, him. So now you can see that in a diaplegic CP, you can do, you usually do a, a zone two lengthening, which is the Vulpius breaker, breaker or striers, which is whatever is your preference. And you should never do a zone two lengthening. However, in a hemiplegic CP, you, there is an indication for doing a zone three lengthening, which, which uh, of whichever means you like. So what I do is an open sliding tendo Achilles lengthening, which is the White's procedure. And typically a plaster is given. How do you approach? So what I am going to focus on now is how to approach when there is a bony deformity of equino fixed equino cavovirus in cerebral palsy. And I uh, did my fellowship with Dr. Mubarak and he's a great follower, uh, a great uh, describer of these osteotomies for cavus foot deformities. So uh, uh, Dr. Manoj described um, the, the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, which he does often. I do the triple C osteotomies for both the plano valgoid foot and the, the equino cavovirus foot in the reverse uh, order in the case of uh, the pest cavus. So this is a very good surgery, which gives rise to a good multi-level correction of the deformity. There's robust correction of all components and can be fashion, fashioned based on the location and extent of deformity, which means that if there is not much of varus, but more of cavus, you may not do the cuboid osteotomy. If there is not much of heel virus, you may not do the calcaneal osteotomy. So this can be fashioned based on the location and extent of the deformity. So it's primarily a reverse triple C osteotomy with first metatarsal osteotomy and a peroneus longus to brevis transfer. So I'm just going to describe it in this model. So what happens is that there is some amount of metatarsal, first metatarsal drop. So there is a dorsal closing wedge osteotomy of the base of the metatarsal, which is done which again helps it and there is a open wedge osteotomy which is a plantar open based osteo osteotomy of the medial cuneiform this helps in correcting the pronation of the first ray which is very important to correct the cavus the graft which is which is obtained from the first dorsal metatarsal osteotomy is placed in the in the cuneiform next this is how the graft is placed Next is an oblique incision for the, for the calcaneum. <coughs> you go subperiosteally, elevate it, ele elevate the peroneum, and it's an oblique osteotomy, which is a lateral based close wedge osteotomy with a sliding, uh, with a mild sliding. So it's a lateral translation and a close wedge osteotomy. So it's a closure of the wedge with a lateral translation. Then, if there is significant amount of virus, then you do a cuboid close wedge osteotomy and you can fix it with either a staple or a k-wire and lastly you transfer the peroneus longus now peroneus longus goes behind the fifth metatarsal and is attached to the base of the first metatarsal now this is a contributor of the first metatarsal top so you transfer the peroneus longus to the peroneus brevis so this is one component of the of the of the osteotomy so this this leads to a very good correction and robust correction of all components of the equino cavovirus deformity. This is another uh, case. This was almost an 18 year old boy, a big boy with an equino cavovirus deformity. A TL lengthening with uh, the triple C osteotomy was done. This was at about one year. He's doing fairly good and walking plantigrade. Just finally, uh, the take home points. This is commonly seen in hemiplegic CP. I have restricted my talk to hemiplegic CP. 
you evaluate whether it's a dynamic or a static deformity and see which is the component which is more important either a tibialis posterior or tibialis anterior and tackle it uh, uh, as per the child in the dynamic deformity the primary surgeries are steinlers and a ten ten tendoachylis lamina with or without a tibialis posterior recession if there is a heel varus in stance or with or without a split tibialis anterior transfer if there is a uh, uh, some amount of inversion in swing and if there is a static deformity then go for something known as a triple c osteotomy which is with additional first dorsal metatarsal osteotomy with a medial cuneiform plantar open wedge osteotomy the calcaneal lateral closing or translational osteotomy with cuboid close wedge and a pl to pb transfer thank you very much thank you sir for this crisp talk regarding the principles and management of equino kevo varus foot so we can take questions if anybody has a question <clears throat> hey mandar this Hi, is sir. sham how, how are you good so nice to see so, you in this yeah yeah good to see you nice talk so the triple c osteotomy remember i was also a san diego fellow years ago right, sir. and um, i was waiting for your comments sir yeah so the one thing that i actually um, over the years have changed in the triple c okay. is i was never convinced that you can actually get much fulcrum correction through the midfoot with just the medial cuneiform osteotomy okay so so over the years what i have done is to take a wedge through the medial middle and lateral cuneiforms the okay. fulcrum being the junction between the lateral cuneiform and the cuboid so okay. i have found that i get much more effective corrections there and those joints really don't matter very much because Absolutely. there's not much movement in the intercuneiform yeah. joints right so that's just a little little experience point that i have had um but over the years okay. also having worked with both wenger and mubarak uh for a flat foot my preference has been a lateral column lengthening because okay. i i you know i think the way it corrects the the three dimensional you know pes acetabuli concept yeah. is much better than the triple c does and you know anecdotally as fellows we all used to see all their patients mubarak's and wenger's wenger did not do triple c's mubarak did them and wenger's flat feet looked always better than mubarak's did post op <laughs> okay just just a little Absolutely. a little you know an anecdotal evidence you know um, but otherwise i think you know everything you have said is good um um you know in, in C cp is a hard thing the only place where you see quinovarus deformities in cp is in spastic hemis you don't see it in spastic dies you don't see it in the rest of the patients so you know it's that unique subset of patients who are usually fairly functional that you see this particular deformity you know absolutely yeah thank you thanks for your so thank you mandar sir for taking out time just after your ot and incorporating this webinar in your schedule thank you sir thank you, thank you manoj sir so we are bang on time we are just finishing exactly on time and thank you everyone for joining in and we'll see you next saturday with yet another webinar on management of upper limb deformities in cerebral palsy thank you bye bro thank you sir See you. Thank you. Bye.